Hello, everybody. Uh, good evening, good, good afternoon to, to all participants here. And uh, now we'll have a great uh, moment with Shelly uh, Brusnwick. Uh, Shelly Brusnwick is CEO of Space Foundation, uh, bringing uh, a lot of new perspectives, a uh, deep vision about the global space ecosystem. Uh, she presents a very distinguished career as a space, uh, as a space, a space uh, professional and leader, uh, also having many uh, uh, different activities, collaborating with U.S. Air Force uh, during that time, uh, also collaborating in the Center for Innovation and Education Symposium uh, uh, 365 and Global Alliance. She advocates for space technology innovation and entrepreneurship, also collaborates with government, commercial and educational sectors on initiatives about space commerce, young professionals, uh, teacher developments, space inspiring curriculum. Uh, Bruce Nwick's work uh, is very connected to, to groups uh, in terms to stimulate the, the, the STEAM practice also, she was selected as the 2020 Diversity and Inclusion Officer and Role Model of the Year by Women Tech Network and Women of Influence by Colorado Spring Business Journal. And she speaks to many kinds of organizations, also share of Humans Aerospace, uh, UIA Foundation, share of Space Entrepreneurship, and many other positions uh, also. Yes, uh, Shelly, sorry, your curriculum is very, very strong. And you are welcome to emphasize some points that you'd like to uh, to uh, bring some, some attention. Also, uh, the conference of, of uh, in, that happens every year in Colorado Springs is very well known around the world. And please uh, bring us also during our talk about more details about uh, the the next edition during 2024 because I believe part of this the part of this audience today will be interested to to stay with you next year in Colorado Springs. Okay, thanks so much for your interest to collaborate in the uh, space of that event. This is the uh, this is our fourth edition. And thanks so much for the audience today. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm really honored to be joining you. And as you said, I'm Shelley Brunswick, and I'm currently the Chief Operating Officer at Space Foundation. And I'll just kind of share with your audience a little bit about my background. Um, so I'll, I always like to say I have three chapters to my journey. And that first chapter, I enlisted in the US Air Force right out of high school. You know, I didn't know what I wanted to do with my career. I didn't have any money to go to college and I really wanted to see the world. And the Air Force was a great way to do that. So I got stationed in Turkey and Germany during my enlisted time. And so I got to see the world. I got to understand a diversity of culture and that has carried forward to my current uh, role here at, uh, at, in the global space ecosystem as space has become more global. Well, I was an enlisted airman. I also was assigned to be a personnel specialist, so human relations. So I learned a skill set. And I did earn what they called uh, money to go to college when I separated. But what I actually started doing while I was on active duty was going to school at night and on the weekends. And that allowed me to complete both my bachelor's and master's degrees to ultimately apply and then be some selected to become a space acquisition officer for the Air Force. So space acquisition is like space project management or procurement. And what that did was start the second chapter of my journey in the 90s. Now I will highlight in the 90s, we really didn't know much about space. And the real way to come into space still in the 90s was you came in a traditional way, which meant you primarily came in through the military or a civil space agency like a NASA. So I came in a sort of traditional way because I came in through NASA, but somewhat not traditional. 
because normally people were STEM professionals coming into the space industry, science, technology, engineering, mathematics. And I actually have a business degree and an MBA. So I came into the space industry both traditionally through the military, but then non-traditional because I had a different background. And that will tie into why this is so important, because as I entered my third chapter of my journey, which is where I am today at Space Foundation, you can see how much the space industry has changed over 25 years, where we can see a lot of diversity, a lot of globalization, um, a lot of opportunities. And so as I look at my journey um, over the last those last three chapters, I can really see how space has changed as well as I've changed with it. And so what I'm going to share with you today is I do have some slide presentation. So we're going to try to bring that up. And again, you know, Julio, if, if something doesn't go right, let me know. So here we go. You know, technology is a wonderful thing and then it's not a wonderful thing. So, um, okay. So again, I'm kind of sharing with you today about how space is part of our daily lives now and how space is for everyone. I got a little latency here, so um, go back there. Sorry about that. We got a little bit ahead of ourselves. Okay, so when we think about space, you know, let's look at what's been happening in 2023. You know, we're seeing this big uh, excitement about going back to the moon with the Artemis missions, and from the moon, we can go on to Mars. We're seeing where we're looking at the end life of the International Space Station and private companies are now being awarded contracts for space stations. We're seeing commercialization where private citizens can pay money and can go to space and may eventually be able to do trips around the moon. And we are still seeing those scientific missions. We're seeing great images and information still coming back from the James Webb Space Telescope. We're seeing NASA and the European Space Agency still doing amazing research missions. So space has become very diverse in 2023. Lots of opportunities both for government um, and industry to participate. And so you can see this big theme of going to the moon and onto Mars and beyond. But what I really want to highlight for you is how space is really coming back here to Earth and how it's benefiting us. So in 2022, the global space economy was $546 billion. And what's really exciting about that is 78% of that space economy is commercial. You know, it's products and services we're using every day. Um, I'm going to play this great video. We'll see if it plays. Julio, if it plays and it doesn't have sound, let me know. There's no words in the video. Um, it's just music. So just let me know if it works. Because again, technology is great, but it doesn't always work. Altitude velocity light. Eight and a half down. Two twenty feet. Fifteen forward. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff on Apollo 11. Dave, an extraordinary television picture here. And this is exploration at its greatest. This nation should commit itself to achieving the goal of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. Okay, here's the design. Stand out here in the wonders of the unknown at Hadley, I try to realize there's a Fundamental truth to our nature. Man must explore. 
So we can kind of see that amazing technology that has transpired from the Apollo era, from that video. You know, even today we're using Zoom and telecommunications is all brought to us because of space technology and innovation. You know, think about what the pandemic would have been like had we not had telecommunications for telehealth, telework, teleschool. And one of my favorite types of space technology is taking those photos with our, with our cameras, those selfies, and many of your cameras are using NASA images technology to capture that perfect photo and of course my husband was a firefighter for 30 years and thanks to Apollo era space technology fire retardant clothing he was able to come home every day so we can see how space is part of our everyday life and we have it in healthcare and more but I also want to tie in how is space supporting the sustainable development goals you know a lot of times we hear well, why are we doing space? There's all these challenges on earth. And, you know, we should really focus on our problems here at home before we start looking to go to space. And so what I wanna highlight is in 2015, the United Nation members all voted on 17 sustainable development goals. And we're supposed to achieve these goals by 2030. Now we are a little behind, but each and every one of these sustainable development goals has a component that relates to space technology and innovation. Now, one place you could go to look for that is you could go to the United Nations Office of Outer Space Affairs website, and there's a drop-down menu that highlights the 17 sustainable development goals and how space is part of each and every one of them. And at Space Foundation, we're really excited to be part of contributing to those sustainable development goals. You know, we look at gender equality, quality education, partnerships for goals, innovation and entrepreneurship. So we are contributing to reaching those goals by 2030. And I'll just highlight some space technology as it relates to those sustainable development goals. Now we think about food security and how important that is, especially as we look at climate change and you know some parts of the planet are becoming hotter and drier, uh, more challenging to grow food. So there's other ways to grow food, packaged food. What I'm gonna highlight in this slide is if you look on your far left-hand side, you're gonna see these three women. And these are entrepreneurs that I met in, uh, that were going to Qatar University studying to be nutritionist. Now you would not normally think a nutritionist would be part of the space industry. But what they wanted to do is they wanted to create a healthy, delicious snack that would also help to reduce food waste. So what they did is they looked at fruits and vegetables that are normally thrown away and they took freeze dried technology, which is a traditional form of space technology from the Apollo era, freeze dried technology. They used that to use these fruits and vegetables that are normally thrown away, repackage them, and now there's a healthy, delicious snack that helps to uh, reduce food insecurity around the world. And now they've become entrepreneurs. So they've taken space technology, it's helped them become entrepreneurs, unlock innovation, and now create economic development. And so this is the cycle of how space innovation works. It's not just the space to go to space, it's how space can come back to earth, create opportunities, unlock that innovation and entrepreneurship, create jobs and solve real problems here on earth. I also want to highlight a good friend, Basuti Gerdibolo, who has created a program that helps with gender equality and quality education. Now, many of my great friends are doing wonderful programs that relate to education. Uh, we have Verd uh, in Israel, uh, Chara, she's doing amazing things. Space Foundation has education programs through our Leadership Academy. But I really wanted to highlight what Basuti is doing in Africa to help bring gender equality to women and girls and empower them for the fourth industrial revolution, creating that education system, 21st century skills, because by unlocking the innovation of women and girls, it will help us to solve many of our challenges on earth. Remember, women and girls are 50% of our population. We need to bring everyone to the table to be part of solving our greatest challenges on earth. We can also think about clean water and sanitation. And in this slide, what I'm highlighting is my good friend, Lumbi Milambo. Now Lumbi uh, grew up in Africa and she would have to walk four to 10 miles one way to retrieve water for her family. And even after she retrieved that water, uh, that water might've been contaminated. So it would make her, her family and their animals sick. 
and women and girls still in Africa are having to do this. And with climate change, it's becoming a real problem. I had a friend who just went to Kenya to visit his family and he saw where riverbeds are dried up. So these women and girls are having to walk and now dig to get to the water to bring back to their families. So what Lumbi is doing is helping to drill wells that are within 30 minutes walk from a village. And by only having to walk 30 minutes versus four to 10 hours, they can now go to school or get jobs, which helps to eliminate poverty, create gender equality, quality education. So by looking at one form of solving a sustainable development goal, clean water and sanitation, we can solve many others. Now, what I wanna highlight is similar to Earth, everything is recyclable. And we learn that because we've been living on the International Space Station for 20 years as humanity. That means every drop of water we drink on the International Space Station is recycled. It goes through a filtration process and it's tested to ensure it's clean to be reused. That same technology has been tech transferred to commercialization on Earth. And now here in the United States, you can go to many sporting goods stores, purchase a bottle where you can scoop up water from a lake or a river or a puddle, and it will filter that water and make it pure drinking water. We've also seen where that technology of testing the water, like they do on the International Space Station, they use that same testing now to test wells that may have been contaminated from hurricanes or other uh, uh, water events that could contaminate the wells, you know, rivers over flooding their banks and so on. So we can see how space technology can help solve some of these challenges. Another area that we look at is we need to find affordable and clean energy solutions so that everyone on planet Earth has access to power. And so some of the things that they're looking at are improving the current solar panels we have in place, as well as launching solar arrays into orbit that will be assembled in orbit and then transmit the Earth's, uh, the sun's power and energy down to Earth. So there's a lot of ways that we're looking at how we're going to solve the sustainable development goals through space innovation, entrepreneurship, and investment. So for those of you that are in the audience and you're really interested in learning more about this, so there are some great places you can go to look. So NASA and ESA have thousands of patents that are waiting to be commercialized. And specifically at NASA, you can go to their tech transfer office and you can see all the patents that are waiting to be tech transferred. You can apply for the patent. And then um, they also have grants that can help individuals start to commercialize that technology. And so ESA has a similar process. I know the Japanese Space Agency does as well. So there's already innovation out there that's waiting to be unlocked. So I kind of want to talk a little bit about the differences in technology and how things have changed from the 1960s in the Apollo era to today. So when we think about the Apollo era, we were focused on putting a man on the moon and safely returning him to Earth. We weren't thinking about tech transfer. We are thinking about that today. And so we're not only thinking about that technology for the moon, but we're also thinking about the technology that's on Earth that could also go to Mars, because we're talking about habitats on Mars today. So let's look at those technology trends that are out there. You know, we talked about energy already, biotechnology, quantum computing, uh, advanced materials, miniaturization, communications, and more. All of these activities have a space interconnection. You know, the more we can miniaturize something, the more likely we can put it on a launch vehicle and send it into space. As we look at 3D printing, how can we do that on Mars? As we look at habitats on Mars, what could we learn from building habitats on Mars that could help us here on Earth? You know, there are people that are called Mars architects that are looking at creating infrastructure and habitats on Mars but they're also now looking at how they can build those on Earth in austere conditions. So as we look at these technology trends, they're crisscrossing between what we can do on Earth and take that to space or what we're doing in space and how that comes to Earth. And we look at the various economic sectors. There's certainly the space 
sector. And that's all by itself. You know, you can see that one in the right hand side. And that's your launch vehicles, telecommunications, astronauts. But now look at all the other economic sectors, agriculture, education, finance, healthcare, all of these other economic sectors have a cross section and interconnection with space. For instance, agriculture uses precision agriculture, which is using GPS to help do precision agriculture to grow food. And that can increase crop yields by potentially 10%. We also use GPS to ship that food throughout the world. You know, food in the U.S. Can, is also many times grown in Chile or Mexico and then shipped to the U.S. using GPS. So we're using space tracking in agricultural greatly. And there's a lot of other agricultural activities such as vertical farming and more things. Uh, we'll look at vertical farming, maybe on Mars or the internet, uh, a future space station, the moon, but we can also do vertical farming on earth. So each and every one of these economic sectors relates to space. Now let's think about the workforce and how that has changed. We've talked about technology, but now let's look at the workforce. When we look at this picture on the left, we can see this was mission control and launching of Apollo 11. So let's think back to the 1960s and what the workforce looked like. So it was two countries, primarily in a space race, government workers, STEM professionals, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, and primarily a uh, male as you can see from this picture. Now we do know from movies like Hidden Figures that there were women and diversity present and they were doing amazing things that ensured those missions were successful. And we're learning more about that. But now as we pivot from the workforce of the 60s, let's look at the workforce of today. So instead of two nations in a space race, we now have more than 90 countries that are operating in space and many more that want to operate in space or use space technology and innovation to better their citizens' lives here on Earth. We also are looking at, so diversity of regions of the world, we're also looking at multi-generational, and we're looking at gender equality. You can look at the pictures and see men and women from all regions of the world. Another great friend, Ruvimbo Samanga from Zimbabwe. She's a space lawyer. You know, I asked her about the diversity of the workforce and her coming into the space industry. And was it challenging? And she said it was. You know, she had a lot of self-doubts. And there were social, economic, and technical barriers to coming into the technology industry. So it's really important as we look at the space industry that we need to find ways to bring in those underrepresented groups and create pathways. And I'll talk about some pathways and how we can do that shortly. We're also looking at a diversity of skills. So we certainly still need those STEM professionals, science, technology, engineering, and math, but we really need to look at the entire supply chain and how it relates to that um, ultimate goals that we have for, for economic development. So we need workers with high school diplomas all the way to PhDs. We need individuals in the manufacturing sector, you know, welders, electricians. Um, you know, here in the US, we're gonna have a shortfall and we also need program managers, policy makers, technicians, teachers, investors, entrepreneurs, artists, and we still need astronauts. So there's really an opportunity for everyone to be part of this new ecosystem that's part of the space. So let's talk about how do you come into the space industry? How do we create more awareness, creating more access and opportunity into the space industry? And we can do that with this workforce development roadmap that has five steps, awareness, access, training, connecting, and mentoring. So that first step is what we're doing today. We're creating some awareness that there are opportunities for everybody to come into the space industry. And this is one of the things I love to do. I love to go out and meet with young people and talk about the opportunities in the space industry and how they can find a pathway into the space industry. Uh, some of the programs that it's uh, Space Foundation, we partner with. Obviously, joining you today is a fantastic thing. We also partner with the African Union, Puerto Rico's uh, Space Science Trust, Stardust Festival in Canada, World Space Week, ICESCO, and many more. So it's not just doing it by ourselves. It's building partnerships to create that safety net that can help elevate everyone.
And so another great quote from a good friend and uh, Chara knows uh, Dr. Chidima, who's from Africa, who talks about creating that awareness that to get young Africans to venture into a space exploration, innovation and technology, we first have to get them interested with exciting curriculum. It's, it's about creating that awareness all the way into the classroom. We've got to bring that excitement into the day-to-day -day classroom, create that awareness to grow the future workforce. That next step is access. So once people are excited, they know there's an opportunity, how do we create an access point for them to come into it? It can seem very daunting because when you think about space, you might be thinking, well, I have to be an astronaut or a rocket scientist or I don't know how to do that. My country may not be that involved. So we at Space Foundation, as well as this amazing program, thank you, Julio, we're trying to create access points. And Chiara and Mario, I know you're all working to create access points. So some of the things we've done at Space Foundation is we create partnerships and sign memorandums of agreement. One of them is with ICESCO where we're partnered on how do we create space science application and allow emerging space nations to be part of that, you know, bringing space science application to better their daily lives, you know, unlocking that innovation and entrepreneurship to solve challenges here on Earth. The Space Foundation also created our Moon Colony Kit, and it's an actual game that teachers or parents can facilitate with their with students or kids and it's an actual physical game so you don't have to have internet connection which can be a challenge in some places to have internet so it's an actual game with you play with cards and so you're on the moon you have a challenge in your research center something happens maybe something breaks and now you draw a card of a career field and you now have to solve that problem in a group environment with the career field you are. Maybe you're the chief technology officer. Maybe you're the marketing person. Maybe you're the leader. Uh, maybe you're the science officer. And now you work together. And what the Moon Colony Kit highlights is the more than 50 different career fields that are part of the space industry. So we have to create those access points that space is more than the history and it's more than memorizing planets, that it's also amazing careers and opportunities. Some other ways we can create access is by having awards and scholarships. And a great organization that does that is Space Generation Advisory Council. They provide awards that can bring people to uh, conferences. They also have scholarships. Now, the reason these are so important to create access, one, it allows that individual to be able to come to an event where they may not be able to interact and build networks. But also those awards, high quality awards, especially for an emerging space nation, those individuals winning awards could receive national attention for that award from organizations like International Astronautical Society of Found Federation and IAC and SGAC. So these awards and scholarships that are made available allow more access for individuals to come into the space industry, but they also can create awareness and opportunities in emerging space nations. And I want to thank my good friend Antonio Stark, who helped highlight the importance of these things. That next step is really looking at training. So if you want to be an astronaut, you more than likely are going to need a college education, if not a master's or PhD. But there are a lot of other jobs in that pipeline, that workforce pipeline and the pipeline of, um, you know, from the supply chain all the way to finally having the final product. And so those could be formal education, informal education, on the job training, fellowships, internships. So there's a lot of different ways that you can accomplish training. And here's one of the colleagues I wanted to highlight, Verd Cohen Brasile. Chiara, I know uh, you have a partnership with uh, Verd as well. So I don't know if you want to jump in for a minute or talk at the end about your amazing training partnership with her. I might have surprised her. So I'll just keep going. But one of the things Verd does and Chiara is they have a science accelerator helping students to unlock innovation and entrepreneurship. High school, middle school, they're creating real activities. So it's really important that we're bringing that real hands on uh, training into the classroom. And we do that at Space Foundation with our leadership academy that's primary, middle, and high school, all about. Uh, space science application, but then entrepreneurship, innovation, and creating a business. 
That fourth step is about connecting. How do we bring people together? You need to find like-minded individuals to help you unlock and create your, your, um, your goals and accomplish those dreams. So some of those connections you can have, I've talked a lot about Space Generation Advisory Council. There's the United Nations Office of Outer Space Affairs, UNUSA, and they have many different programs. They have Space for Women, Space for Youth, Space Law, Space for Water. So if you're interested in an area, that's a great place to look and find like-minded individuals. There's Women in Aerospace, there's Women Tech Network. Now, even though women is in the name, they are open to men and women. And that means they need men and women to be part of it, but to also be mentors. And one of our programs at Space Foundation that we have is our International Teacher Liaison Program, where we bring in teachers from around the world where they get to network with each other. And then part of what they get is their um, admission to our annual space symposium is complimentary. And we create a special track for those international teachers where they get to network with one another, but they also get to go around the exhibit hall. They get to see all the amazing technology. They get to listen to all the unclassified space sessions. And then they get to bring that innovation back to the classroom to help inspire the next generation. So again, I'm gonna go back to my good friend, Ruvimbo, who highlights the importance of networks and that she learned to appreciate that because it brought together like-minded individuals and it helped her to further her journey. So find those networks that will help you, those like-minded individuals. Now, the last step, which could be the first step, is mentoring. If you find a good mentor, many times they can help you overcome many of the other challenges that you have in your journey. And again, some of those great mentoring programs, Space Generation Advisory Council, Space for Women out of UNUSA. And again, just because women is in the name, it's open to men and women to be mentors and protégés. Same thing with Women Tech Network. They've just opened their mentoring and they're looking for men and women to be mentors and protégés. And I highlight another amazing space generation leader, Sejal Bhutalia. Uh, last year, she did a study on um, having mentoring programs for women um, in the space sector and how that offers, uh, advances them and promotes them. And she found that it was a dynamic change. And she did, this is her picture of her presenting her results at the IAC, International Astronautical Congress, in a uh, in uh, Paris and Chiara, I wanna highlight was her mentor and probably still is her mentor. So again, lots of synergy here. So mentoring is amazing. So again, those are the, the steps, awareness, access, training, connecting, mentoring. So what I'm gonna do is take down the slides and see if we have any questions that we can talk about or if anybody has anything they've put in the chat box. Um, I'm happy to answer questions. Oh, I'm sorry to hear Chiara, your phone died. Um, hopefully you can come back to us. Um, so I'm going to say, Julio, do we have any questions? Does anybody want to add anything? Hey, Jason, it's so great to see you. Um, I, I kind of wanted to share a little bit about how space is part of our everyday lives. And obviously, Julio, if we want to talk about how this space innovation is benefiting us uh, for Mars and how we're planning to go to Mars and be an interplanetary species, I think I kind of shared, you know, water, growing food, generating energy, you know, all the things. I just talked about are all necessary on Mars. Um, obviously, what are our habitats going to look like? You know, some people say we're just going to live in these lava tubes. I talk to other specialists, both mental health as well as architects who say we, we can't as human beings just live in lava tubes. We eventually have to figure out how we're going to have light um, coming into the facility and we have to make it aesthetically pleasing because we are more than just robots, right? We have a lot of AI out there. That's what makes us unique is we are humans. We do have feelings and we have to take that into account as we look at long-term stays. Uh, I see you, Mario, nodding your head, long-term stays on Mars. So one, I know a Mars architect here in the US as well as one in Australia. And then what they're actually looking at doing is how do they bring that space technology that they're thinking about for Mars and building that and designing that in austere conditions, maybe in desert environments, you know, growing food in desert environments, vertical farming. So a lot of these uh, challenges we see for Mars, we are able to use that technology right here on Earth to solve our challenges here on Earth, those sustainable development goals. So it's a really exciting time to be in the space industry, whether you want to solve challenges on Earth, you want to see us go uh, low Earth orbit, uh, 
the moon, or eventually become an interplanetary species. Space is for all of us. So again, I will open the floor to questions. And I know, Julio, I may have gone a few minutes over, but I'm so grateful to be joining you and sharing uh, how we're creating more access and opportunity together. Yes, Shelly, thanks so much for your wonderful and inspiring presentation. I hope it will be very good to sharing in YouTube and people see your presentation in the future. Uh, also, I believe the examples that you have mentioned during the uh, uh, during your talk also uh, bring the names of specific and also very important actors in the space field is very welcome because I I saw some some very uh, uh, friends in your presentation and I'm happy about it because they are. Uh, having the impact uh, uh, by different manners. Yes, and I believe we need to work together with partnership. Also in Brazil, uh, we are uh, organizing space analog missions and also receive uh, kids for to present and then uh, present to them the, also the sustainability, talk about sustainability in space. Yes, and I also I was talking uh, with Jay, uh, Jason Michel about maybe next year uh, visit Colorado Spring because he's uh, invited me so a long time. Maybe next year we'll be there. Awesome. We would love to have you. And what uh, and for those who are listening or might join us on YouTube later, what he's talking about is Space Foundation puts on a global premier space event called Space Symposium that mm -hmm. brings together the global space community. It's military, commercial, civil and international. And this coming year in 2024, it will be April 7th through the 11th. So we hope that you can join us. We also will have that international teacher liaison program running during that time. We'll have a workforce things and Kicking things off, we'll have a Yuri's night uh, to celebrate not only uh, man's first adventure into space, which was Yuri Gagarin, but also it was the start of the space shuttle program. So we hope you can join us at Yuri's night. I know Jason has some amazing events, space symposium, because again, space is for all of us. So we hope you'll join us for that. Okay, uh, questions or comments? And again, I'll share, uh, you can follow me on LinkedIn, follow Julio, follow uh, the Mars Society, but I'm also on LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, uh, X, which, yes. you know, Twitter, uh, YouTube. So Julio, I'm happy to help re-promote because it's a pleasure joining you and uh, looking forward to seeing all of you around the galaxy. Okay. Uh, thanks so much, Shelly, for your contribution, uh, not only for the Space of that event, but for the world. Yes, uh, if you don't have more questions, I believe your presentation was very, was very clear. Yes, uh, okay, I stopped the recording right now. Thanks so much.